morning everyone and good morning those of you joining online this morning and we hope you're all blessed by the service and as you see we have our guest preacher this morning Dr. Kay Devaney and Dr. Kay Devaney served for five years as associate minister at the Church of St. Andrew and St. Paul in Montreal and twice as interim minister at the Kirk of St. James in Charlottetown before hearing the call to ministry, Reverend Kay taught English literature and language, as well as flute, at UPEI. She was delighted to, turn to return to Rice Point PEI in 2018, where she and her husband have made their home. And we welcome to the pulpit this morning. Thank you. Uh, I think it's time for the gathering. Yes.
but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. Good morning. So great to be here with you. And with that unexpected man in the back who's actually not here but on vacation. <laughs> Our opening phrase is, the morning gilds the skies. If you're using the hymn book, that's number 430. Thank you. 
<laughs> o Lord, who may abide in your tent? Who may dwell on your holy hill? Those who walk in and do what is right, and speak the truth from their heart. Who do not slander with their tongue, and do no evil to their friends, nor take up a reproach against their neighbors. In whose eyes wicked are spies, but who honor those who fear the Lord, who stand by their oath, even to their hurt. Who do not lend money and interest, and do not take a bribe against the innocent. Those who do these things shall never be moved. Now, as they went on their way, 
Jesus and his disciples, he entered a certain village where a woman named Martha welcomed him into her home. She had a sister named Mary who sat at the Lord's feet and listened to what he was saying. But Martha was distracted by her many tasks, so she came to him and asked, Lord, do you not care that my sister has left me to do all the work by myself? Tell her, then, to help me. But the Lord answered her, Martha, Martha, you are worried and distracted by many things. There is need of only one thing. Mary has chosen the better part, which will not be taken away from her. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Years ago, when my children were very small, sometimes my son, who was smaller, would absorb quite a bit of my attention, as those of you who have been parents or are parents of young children might imagine. Sometimes when I got too caught up in my many tasks, my daughter, who had her own needs, would intervene. And by the way, she would not appreciate my telling this story today, <laughs> especially if you know her, as some of you do. Placing her hand on my cheek, she would gently but firmly turn my face toward her. <laughs> Pay attention to me, she would say. Pay attention to me. Then one day, a few years later, when my son was not a toddler, but a lad, he also had occasion to intervene. We had been walking across the UPEI campus when we encountered a very dear but rather long-winded elderly professor who had struck up a conversation. Again, if you're parents, you know the awkwardness of this situation. Uh, as a professor, I have to say, droned on and on my son tried pulling at my hand, then tugging at my arm. The droning continued. <laughs> and then, as I struggled to be a polite and respectful listener, he launched himself at my back again and again until finally I had to give up. He wasn't using his words, but his message was just what my daughters had been. Pay attention to me, he was saying. Pay attention to me. To me. Sometimes, as we get mired in the busyness of making our way through life, we need a nudge or a tug or someone leaping on our back to remind us to take care of what is precious in our lives, to be fully present. We often think of Martha and her sister Mary as representing two approaches to Christian life the way of action or service, and the way of contemplation. In his gentle correction of Martha, Jesus seems to give priority to contemplation, that is, of prayer, study, and meditation. Some observers suggest that since the story follows immediately upon the story of the Good Samaritan, the two must be taken together. The lawyer, who knows the teaching on love of God and neighbor, needs to hear Jesus say, go and do. But busy Martha, who already is, is doing as much as she can, as fast as she can, needs to hear, stop and listen. Quite a few of these scholars, by the way, insist that Jesus' affirmation of Mary should by no means be taken to undermine Christians' actions in the world. I suspect that these may be Presbyterian scholars, always urging industry and activity, always suspicious of anything that could lead to self-indulgent idleness, for instance, or useless introspection. By contrast, no one seems to worry that Jesus' instruction to the questioning young lawyer in last week's passage might lead to too much activity, too little prayer and study. Our culture tends to favor doing over being, action over reflection. In general, 
we have an activity bias. We do always want to be productive. Yet, as Christians, we do not believe that our own activity, our good works, are what connect us to God. For by grace you have been saved through faith, the Apostle Paul tells us, and this is not your own doing, it is the gift of God. The countercultural story of Martha and her sister Mary is especially important for us to hear. The real contrast that Mary and Martha embody is not simply the contrast between two modes of Christian life, contemplation and action, listening and doing. To be clear, both are good. The contrast at the center of the story is between listening and distraction. What does it mean to be distracted? I think that everybody could do a little discourse on this one. Yeah. It is more than just being hot and bothered, though, with your hair out of place and a crazed and anxious expression on your face. The English word distract means to divert one's attention, to be pulled away from one thing to another. It once meant to be pulled in different directions. Sometimes distraction is a good thing, as when a clever nurse rings a bell, oh, an overhead bell, the instant after shooting a vaccination into a toddler's arm. I think we can all be grateful for that kind of distraction. But sometimes distraction is not such a good thing. Jesus is in the house, and Mary Martha is not even looking in his direction. Her work and her frustrations, the pot boiling over, the charcoal stove flaring up, the meal spilling onto the table, have diverted her attention. Now, to be fair, Martha's preparations, described in the text as service, are a way of honoring her guest. Just as Abraham and Sarah honored their divine visitors by bringing water to refresh them, cakes of choice flour to nourish them, curds and milk and tender beef to sustain them and delight them. Yet Martha's household tasks and obligations have pulled her away from the one needful thing, which is to know Jesus Christ. And since that one needful thing is also the better part, Martha's frustrations can truly be said to get the better of her. Jesus in the house, is in the house, but Martha is looking in the wrong direction. Jesus is in the house, but Martha, the one who has graciously welcomed him into her home, is in danger of missing him altogether. And so Jesus calls her home. Martha, Martha, you are worried and bothered about so many things, but only one thing is necessary, he tells her. For Mary has chosen the good part, which shall not be taken away from her. Jesus breaks through Martha's distractions and calls her back to that one necessary thing, which is to turn toward him. In other words, as one writer puts it, our priority should be listening to the Word of God. It should be taking time out. It should be sitting down, committing to the act of sitting down and taking a pause. We do this because our service comes after and flows from learning and meditating on the Word of God. For we do not wish to precede the Lord, we must accept to be served before serving. Two weeks ago, we listened to a story that Jesus told that took place on the Jericho Road. So many of Jesus' own encounters are on the roads, in the villages, on a mountain, 
on a level place in the fields. In this story, Jesus steps across the threshold and enters into the sphere of common duties, the domestic sphere. He finds in place the conventions of hospitality as he is welcomed into the house and a meal is made ready for him. Entering into what is there, Jesus reorients conventional arrangements, as he so often does. When Jesus is present, even a woman can sit at his feet as a disciple. When Jesus is present, even the woman offering him hospitality can be relieved of her anxiety and exhaustion and drawn from her many tasks to sit likewise at his feet. For Jesus is the hospitable one, not we ourselves, and Jesus is the one who carries grace into the world. In a deserted place near Bethsaida, Jesus showed hospitality to 5,000 men and women who were hungry for his teaching, although his disciples said that it could not be done. He fed everyone from five loaves of bread and two fish, and from the grace and presence of his teaching. In an upper room in Jerusalem, Jesus showed hospitality not only to the disciples and friends who were present with him, but to all those who came after, when he took bread, blessed it, broke it, and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given for you. And in a house on the road to Emmaus, Jesus once again took bread, blessed and broke it, and gave it to those at the table with him, causing their eyes to open and their hearts to burn within them. It is this hospitality, this grace, that Jesus offers to Martha as well as to Mary when he comes into their house and calls them from their cares to his side. It is this hospitality, this grace, that Jesus offers to us as well. And so we gather to receive that hospitality. We listen to God's word. We approach God in prayer. We put ourselves under the grace of the cross when we confess our sins, as in Jesus Christ, God has drawn near to us and entered into our own lives. So let us draw near to Him. May it be so. Amen. Our praise is may the mind of Christ my Savior.
Let us once again join our hearts together in prayer. Let us pray. Lord God, loving God, we come before you in prayer, trusting that your power works in the world in ways we cannot even imagine, calling goodness forward, supporting love and creating justice even in situations that seem hopeless to us. Draw our prayers as signs of your spirit at work in our lives. God, with an open heart, open our hearts to you. God of the world and all its peoples, we pray today for those who lift up their voices in troubled nations, for those working to bring justice and negotiate peace, for those bringing aid to the vulnerable, for those offering shelter to anyone fleeing violence. God, with an open heart, open our hearts to you. God of our everyday lives, we pray today for our community and our neighbors whose everyday lives have been disrupted by pandemic realities and economic realities beyond their control. We remember neighbors whose livelihoods have become insecure as our weather systems <coughs> change. And we lift up to you especially communities where water or medical care or jobs are scarce. God, with an open heart, open our hearts to you. God of the courageous and compassionate, we pray for those who live out their commitment to the well-being of others day by day in public service, health care, education, social work, community organizations, and environmental concern. For their dedication and for the real and practical help they offer, we give you thanks. God, with an open heart, open our hearts to you. We remember in silence those on our hearts facing some kind of challenge this day. Draw near to each one in deep need, O oh God. Equip us to support those lives that intertwine with ours, for we are your people, embraced by your love. God, with an open heart, open our hearts to you. We give thanks for all those who have gone before us in faith, who have sat at your feet, who have sought your presence, and who have pointed the way to you. Lead us to, O oh loving Lord, from despair to hope, from fear to trust, from hate to love. Let peace fill our communities, our households, and our hearts. We ask all these things in the name of Jesus the Christ, who came among us at his great cost to befriend us and to redeem us. Amen. Our closing praise is Lord of all power. Number six hundred and twenty-six. What? Announcements. Oh my goodness. All right. Announce away. Announce away. <laughs> this morning we have had the great pleasure of having Dr. Benny with us again and leaving up with another inspiring message. And sometimes it is nice just to sit and listen to Jesus. And, and uh, as we sing our, our song shortly, Megan and I, this actually fits nicely in. But our announcements this morning, uh, the Hamiltons, as you know, are on vacation. And uh, Susie is here today, being very good taping for us. And we have our AV aptly taken care of with Sarah in the back corner. So we thank them. Um, but if you need of any pastoral care, let me or your elder know. And Thursday is prayer time at 9 a.m. If you have prayer requests, you can let Jeanette, Eleanor, or I know. And uh, next Sunday we have worship at 10.30. And we need your help. It's coming on to September. We're looking for ushers and greeters, readers, fellowship time hosts. The information is in the bulletin. The papers are to sign up are in the foyer. And it's not an onerous task, but we do 
appreciate if you could sign up and help us out with that. So this morning, Megan and I will be singing in the garden.
and your smallness and ordinariness, your thirst for justice and your desire for closeness in us. As we leave this place, help us to take something of all these parts of you into the world with us and to encounter you in our relationships and the events of our lives. Amen. May God bless you this week. Power of the Father, friendship of the Son, encouragement of the Holy Spirit on this day and indeed forevermore.